In today's class, I'm gonna teach the ultimate beginner's guide to dividend investing. You're gonna learn why this strategy has been so popular for over 100 years. I'm gonna share with you the historical rates of return from a dividend investing strategy, so you can see how it stacks up and compares to other strategies. And I'm gonna walk you through my own process of stock selection, how to choose the best dividend stocks to buy and to hold in my long-term portfolio. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right in here. This is a five chapter class. We're gonna teach all five chapters today in one stretch. So grab a notepad, grab a pen, and let's go ahead and jump in with chapter one, intro to dividend investing. So I'm gonna answer your first question, which is Ross, what is a dividend and how does the strategy work? The dividend investing strategy is based on buying shares of companies that have elected to pay out a dividend. A dividend is a check that all the shareholders on record receive and it is a distribution of a little bit of the company's profit. Now, dividends are paid out on a quarterly schedule. And in this example here, the company has elected to pay out a dividend of 25 cents per share, and they do that four times a year. So if you own 1,000 shares times 25 cents, you would get a check for $250 four times a year. And that right there is the definition of passive income. You are being rewarded as a shareholder of this company. There are some investors who say, why would you ever buy shares of a company that don't pay out a dividend? You know, if you buy a rental property, don't you want to receive rental income? If you buy a stock, don't you want to get dividend income? Yes, you do. Now, the reason that some people will buy shares of companies that don't pay out dividends is because they believe the value of the stock is going to go up so much over the next few years, it'll far exceed what they might make in dividend returns. But naturally, it's more speculative. That's like buying a property that's not going to produce any cash flow or any profit over the next three years, but you hope that you'll be able to sell it for more money later. Well, what if the market goes down? Then you're stuck with it. Now, if you're holding a dividend paying stock and the market suddenly drops, yes, the underlying value of your stock has declined from let's say $100 a share, even if it went all the way down to $50 a share, a 50% drop, but you would still be receiving the same 25 cents per share because it's based on the number of shares you're holding. And so what would effectively happen is the amount of money being paid out as a dividend, that percentage would increase based on the total amount of money you had in the trade, but the dividend amount would remain the same. And that's why this has been such a popular strategy because even during stock market crashes, even during the Great Depression, these companies continue to pay out a dividend. So if you want to live off of dividends, knowing that this income is more or less protected, even during stock market recessions and depressions, you need to do the math. So let's say you want to get $10,000 every quarter. Well, now you need to back out here and figure out how many shares of this company would I need to own? And the answer here is 40,000. Now, it's possible that owning 40,000 shares of this company is cost prohibitive for you right now, which means you would need to look for a company that pays out a higher quarterly dividend. And that's easy to do based on what I'm going to show you later in this class. Now, of course, the nice thing with investing in stocks is that they are very liquid. You can get in and you can get out quickly. But I am a big fan of dividend stocks just because the, the general concept of I like getting paid for holding shares of this company. So what happens for a lot of companies is that in their early stages of growth, when they're growing really quickly, the, the growth phase, they don't pay out a dividend. They reinvest all the profit in growing the company, making the company bigger and bigger and bigger so they can make more and more money. And that's the phase where some investors are going to invest in these early phase uh, stocks that are in the growth phase. Okay, I get it. I understand that strategy. But at a certain point, those companies could get to a scale where they can no longer reasonably invest all of the money that they're making each year and continue to scale the company exponentially. There is no exponential curve on a company's growth. It just doesn't you know, work like that to infinity. What ultimately happens, and it's happened with um, even you know, big investment firms like Berkshire Hathaway, they have periods of really big growth, and then when they get so big, the growth sort of slows down. So this is the phase where the growth slows down that the companies often will elect to begin paying out a dividend. And it's in the form of a per share payment. So it's based on how many shares you own of the company. Okay, so let's say you own 1000 shares of a company, and they're paying out an 80, um, an, sorry, an 80 cent annual dividend, they're going to pay that out 20 cents per quarter. So every uh, quarter, you're going to get a check for $200. And at the end of the year, you're going to have made $800. Basically, this is passive income, you don't have to do anything for it, 
All you're doing is holding the stock, but you're getting rewarded for it and you're making $800 by the end of the year. Now, the problem, well, so two things. So number one, there's a lot of advantages to dividend investing because you can receive this $800, but you're not having to sell any of your shares. However, the, the problem, or perhaps the downside, is that you're now investing in stocks that are at a lower rate of growth over the long term. So you have to factor in your dividend payments as part of the return that you're receiving. And that can be a little hard because sometimes people say, well, geez, I bought this stock at 100 and now it's been two years and it's only at, let's say, $110, which means it's only gone up like 5% and then another 5%, more or less, right? So they'll say, ah, it's not really performing, but you were receiving a dividend. So now you have to factor in how much you made in dividends over those two years with the, the, the actual rate of return. And I think that's easy for most people to understand once you sort of lay it out. But initially, some people are put off by dividend stocks because they just say, oh, you know, they're not going to return, you know, 20% in, in one year, like maybe Tesla will. But remember, with dividends, you're getting that dividend, whereas with growth stocks, it's much more speculative. Okay, so the reason I like dividend stocks so much is because I value assets that produce cash flow. I don't like assets that I'm holding it and it's based purely on the speculation that's going to be worth more later. You know, like Bitcoin, you don't get a dividend. You buy it and then, you, you know, you hope it's worth more later. I would much rather buy shares of a real company, hold those shares and receive a payment, a small distribution of shareholder profits every single year in the form of a dividend. That's awesome. So what I like about dividend stocks even more than real estate is that it is a liquid asset. What I mean by that is that in the form of real estate, when you've got a piece of real estate and you want to sell it, you know, you can't sell it just like that. You can't sell it just by pressing a button. And when you do sell it, you've got to pay real estate fees, taxes, and all this stuff. What I really like about dividend stocks and the stock market in general is the liquidity that you can buy with a click of a button and you're in. And when you want to get out, you can sell it. And just like that, it's gone. So there's a feeling where you don't have to be incredibly committed to the stock. If you want to get out, just like that, it's gone and you're out. So I love that about stocks in general. And dividend stocks are great because not only do you receive some passive income from it, you also have the ability just to sell it whenever you want. Now, like real estate, um, dividend stocks can be used as collateral for borrowing. As I'm sure you're uh, well aware, many people will buy a home putting down, you know, 20% or something like that, and then the remaining 80% is financed by the lender. Now, with the stock market, you can buy on leverage where you put down 50%, and then your broker will match that and give you another 50% for investing. Traditionally, it's considered pretty risky to be investing as a novice retail investor on leverage. It's one thing, day trading on leverage is also risky, but at least with day trading, our exposure is minimized by the fact that we're not holding the stocks for very long. When you're investing and you're holding overnight, that's when you do subject yourself to the risk of being in when some really bad news comes out and all of a sudden we see you know a crash in the market. Now, even in spite of stock market crashes, the dividend investing strategy has been proven to still be profitable over the long term. When you look at very, very short windows of time, like a three month window, there could be periods where it's losing, but then it makes up for it over time. So the reality is that investing on leverage is quite risky, but what you can do and what a lot of banks will let you do is you can hold your, your entire portfolio right here and then you can borrow against it to put that money somewhere else. So if you want to borrow against that portfolio, to invest in real estate or something like that, then you can use it as collateral. Now, most people probably wouldn't choose to do that, but it's nice that it is an option. And obviously, because I trade in a Roth IRA, I love that the dividend investing strategy works well in this type of account. Roth IRAs are tax-free, so you don't pay any income tax on your dividend payments, and the growth of the stock is also uh, will be tax-free when you eventually sell it. This is very much a passive strategy based just on the amount of time commitment required to generate the income. You put the you buy a position and you can hold it for years. Historically, dividend stocks have been a defensive investment that do perform well in poor markets. And I really like that about them. I feel like I personally have more market exposure than the typical 
person might because I'm a trader. So my day trading income is dependent on the performance of the market. You know, I, I will do well. I've made money in bear markets, but I make more money in bull markets. So if I'm not going to make as much during a bear market, then I don't want to also put my long-term investments in a vehicle that's also going to really struggle during a bear market. I have to be a little bit more defensive than somebody else. Now, someone that has income that goes up during a bear market, um, you know, they they could treat things differently. But every everyone's different, so that's just my uh, two cents. So I prefer the defensive nature of dividend stocks. And additionally, something that is nice is that you can produce income not just from the dividend that you get, but you can also produce income through the use of options trading against the position with covered calls and cash secured puts. We'll talk about those more uh, a little bit later in the class because they're more advanced. So when we look at the history of dividend investing, going back to 1960, 84% of the return of the S&P 500 index can be attributed to reinvesting dividends and the power of compounding growth. This is really powerful. This is the difference between $795,000 and nearly 5 million bucks. All right, so dividends are a big deal. Now, when we look at the dividend return versus market return by decade, in the 1940s, dividends accounted for 60%, 67% of the total returns. In the 1950s, they accounted for 30%. They were 44% in the 1960s. They were 73% during the 1970s, which was a terrible year or terrible decade for stock market performance. In the 1980s, they accounted for 28%. And they accounted for just 16% during the 1990s. During the 1990s, and this was we led into the uh, dot-com bubble, the market was so strong that companies started decreasing their dividend and reinvesting in their in, the, in their selves to help the company grow and capitalize and make as much as they could during the 90s. But then we went into the 2000s, which was a lost decade. And the only return was from dividends. But it was lower than uh, in previous decades because companies had changed their priorities. The 2010s, this was uh, the recovery during the great from the great recession, strong market performance, smaller dividend return. The 2020s so far has been um, smaller as well as we've had strong growth in the overall market. Now, the overall average is 40%. So that's from 1930 through the end of 2021, just for reference. So uh, dividend aristocrats and kings are the two stock, the two types of dividend stocks that we're going to talk about, especially in this class. A dividend aristocrat are stocks or companies that have been paying and increasing dividends each year for 25 consecutive years. That's a dividend aristocrat. There are 67 stocks on this list right now. It, but it'll change. It, it does change. 54 of those stocks are also dividend kings. What's a dividend king? A dividend king is a stock or company that's been paying and increasing dividends for 50 consecutive years. There are 54 stocks on this list. This is an incredible list. These are the types of stocks that you don't have to worry about them decreasing or cutting the dividend. So these are some of the most defensive stocks. Now, because they have been paying out a dividend consecutively for so many years, these are also companies that are very mature. They're, they're not likely to go anywhere in the next 15, 20 years. They should be here still, but the percentage that they return is smaller. And the percentage growth that they uh, produce each year as a, as a stock is also smaller. And that's a sacrifice. But this is also sort of a trade-off for a lower risk, more defensive position where you can benefit from dividend income and something that would be a bit more um, risky, like some of the tech stocks right now that are producing big returns, but um, certainly won't sustain that forever. So as an overview of the dividend investing strategy, I use a set of both fundamental and technical criteria for choosing what I believe are the strongest and most resilient dividend paying stocks. I'll share this with you in chapter two. I choose stocks I believe will still be paying dividends 10 years from today. Now, of course, it's just my opinion, but I believe it. While I prefer not to overpay for a stock, I also believe in the ability to do cost averaging over time. It's more important, in my opinion, to be holding a position because as soon as I'm holding a position, I can begin to use options strategies to generate additional income from that position. 
So it really is more important for me to be in the position so I can start producing that income from options trading. And as soon as I'm in, I can start receiving my first dividend check at the next quarter. So here's something really crazy. If you had invested $20,000 into the market in 1927, just before the Great Depression, this giant stock market crash, if you had done that and you had held the whole way through, by 1990, you would have had $5.5 million. That is the incredible power of compound interest over 60 years, 60 years in the market. Now, some of you watching, you may be young enough to be able to benefit from 60 years of compound interest if you start putting your money away today. So this is very powerful. It's a powerful tool that if you don't know how to capitalize on it, you're going to forever keep yourself down. So in my opinion, if you're an active trader, I'm a day trader. I mean, of course, you are, you already know that. But as an active trader for me, I have to reinvest my trading profits into long-term uh, accounts in the market. So in my opinion, you would be doing yourself a huge disservice if you don't reinvest some of your income, whether it's day trading profits or it's the income you make at a W-2 or whatever, if you don't reinvest some of that income for long-term growth. So I personally trade with multiple accounts. So one of the things, of course, that I learned early on was that if I make more money than I need for my cost of living, I'm still paying income tax on all that extra profit. So I said, no, 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 I'm gonna bring that down. I'm only gonna make in my taxable accounts the minimum I need to cover my cost of living. And then everything from that point forward, boom, I'm done with that account for the rest of the year. I'm not gonna trade in it or for the rest of the month, whatever the case is, I'm gonna switch to my retirement account, which is my IRA account. All right, so I too, I use my Roth IRA and trade in that account, and that way I can grow tax-free. You can do the same thing. You can set up a retirement account, you can start funding it, and you can grow wealth tax-free. There is no reason you shouldn't do this. Compound interest at the rate of 8 to 10% a year. Let me just give you a couple examples. If you were making 400 a day, and you put half of that away into a retirement account, 200 a day. If you did that in a trading account, a Roth IRA, or you, you were able to save $200 a day, it's $50,000 a year. If you did that for 10 years, you'll have saved 500 grand, right? 10 years, 10 years times 50,000 a year, right? That's $500,000. But by the end of the 10 years, because of the 8 to 10% return, the compounding growth, that account would already be worth $869,000, which means you've made $369,000 on compound interest and growth. That is huge. That's just over 10 years. If you kept doing that for 20 years, you'll have saved $1 million, but the account will be worth nearly $3 million. This compound, this, this equity curve increases exponentially as you have more time. I have an, an incredible story that I'm going to share with you about this just to really um, you know, bring it home. Now, many of us um, who are in this financial space know about the rule of 4% and the rule of 300. What it says is that if you take your monthly income and you multiply it by 300, that's the amount of money you need to have saved in order to retire. So if you're spending $5,000 a month right now, that's your cost of living, multiply that by 300, that's $1.5 million. $1.5 million is your retirement goal. Because once you have $1.5 million in the bank, you can withdraw 4% of that. And historically, you've been able to withdraw 4% indefinitely because you're benefiting from 8 to 10% growth. You've got 8 to 10% growth. So when you pull out 4% of that, you're not pulling 4% of the growth. You're pulling out 4% of the, of the principal. You're still benefiting from growth. The account continues to grow. Now, certainly it's going to grow slower because you're taking money out, but it'll continue to grow. So... Uh, it's been said that you can withdraw 4% per year indefinitely. So on a $1.5 million account, 4% per year is 60000 a year or 5000 a month. So the way you figure out your magic number, this is your retirement number, is you multiply your current cost of living or your monthly income target, how much you want to be making, by 300. Now remember, if you're not going to retire for 20 years, you should factor, factor in inflation. That $5,000 uh, today is not going to be the same. It won't go as far as, as it will. To, you know, It won't go as far in 20 years. So maybe in 20 years, it's, you should be at $10,000 and then you need to be at 3 million. But this is something that I always think is really important. I always try to educate and, 
and provide this financial literacy, of course, to our members, but even to those that are tuning in on YouTube, because I want to empower you to make better decisions for your future. If you're able to start saving and benefiting from compound interest and you do it through dividend stocks, amazing. If you want to do this investing long term and you want to buy NVIDIA and Tesla and higher risk stocks, by all means. It's just important that you start learning about this process. It's not taught in most schools. So we have to learn it on our own. So I commend you for um, being interested enough to spend your time learning about this. So the reason the rule of 4% works is because historically the market returns 8% per year. It leaves room both for withdrawals and continued account growth. Now there will be years where the market goes down and you're still pulling out that 4%, which does hurt it. But statistically, this is what financial advisors have used to help uh, people understand how much money they need to save in order to retire. So now here is an incredible story. A route to an $8 million portfolio started with frugal living. If this isn't inspiring, I don't know what is. This was an article in uh, the Wall Street Journal. It was uh, written back in 2015 about Ronald Reed. Now, Ronald Reed was a longtime resident of Brattleboro, Vermont. Now, you may know that I grew up in Brattleboro, Vermont. In fact, he lived just down the street from me. He died at the age of 92, and his friends were shocked to find that his estate was valued at $8 million. Now, he did something pretty incredible, and he kept it a secret, and then he gave that money to the local library and the local hospital, uh, two of the biggest donations that they had ever received. But what's really incredible about this story is that this is a person who never had a fancy college degree in finance. Now, he wasn't an MBA. He was never a CEO. He was never a big fancy businessman. He worked at the gas station, and he, then he worked during his retirement at JCPenney's. He had a very modest house. He was very frugal, which isn't necessarily something to aspire to. But what is inspirational here, and I think is incredible, is that from a very young age, he was interested and fascinated in the stock market. And so what stocks did he buy? He bought dividend paying stocks. And he started doing it when he was a young man. Now he lived to the age of 92. He had like 70 years of compound interest. And that's how you turn $20,000 into 5.5 million. Now he didn't start by putting a ton of money in right away. What he did was he would just with each paycheck, he would buy one share, one share, one share. He just kept buying a couple of shares, a couple of shares. And it, over the years, his portfolio grew and grew and grew. So I think that this is really just an incredible story because this isn't a story of someone who is making $200,000 a year. You know, he wasn't making $100,000 a year. He was just slow and steady reinvesting the money he made. He kept his head down, he kept reinvesting, and he was able through, you know, dividend investing, turn his portfolio into $8 million. So I think of trading uh, specifically and investing is there's different term, there's different buckets of risk. So the first bucket of risk is the lowest risk bucket. And this is where we have passive long-term investing, Div investing for dividends, you know, with a five to 10% return per year, we're not going to get big juicy returns. So if you, if right now, let's just say, for instance, you have $1,000 to your name, um, and this is kind of extreme, but let's just say, for instance, and you put that whole thousand dollars into a dividend invest and dividend paying stock like Johnson and Johnson, they probably right now pay like a 1.5% dividend. So realistically, <laughs> you're only going to make $15 a year, $15 a year on, on the dividend return. Now, if the underlying stock Johnson Johnson goes up 5%, you'll make another 50 bucks on that. So you'll be up $65 on the year between the two right? It's not a lot. It, I mean, $65. This isn't even, this is just, this might not even cover some of the fees that would come out of your account, depending on what broker you use, right? Now, okay. So if you've got $1,000, you're probably going to be someone who's like, oh, I, I want to buy the next cryptocurrency that's going to go up, you know, 8,000%. So I can turn my $100 into, you know, or $1,000 into 80 grand or 100 grand or something. Well, the, the middle risk of return is swing trading. And this is the short time frame of being an investor where you're buying something and you're holding for a few days, a few weeks, maybe a few months. And this is what a lot of people do with Bitcoin. They do it with Tesla. They do it with NVIDIA. They, you know, they're trying to grow their account by at least 10% a year. Of course, you want to, if you're going to take the risk, you want to outperform the lowest risk bucket of return, but you might be able to grow your account by 100% in a year or more. But 
you know, there is some limit to this because you're not sitting in front of your computer, so you're not able to be super, super aggressive. You might take some positions on your phone and sort of passively uh, invest in the market. It's still pretty passive. And then the highest risk and return area is what I would say would be day trading. It can return over 100% in the year. And just for reference, this year I started um, with $116,000 in my account. So $116,000 account. And my account right now is just under 300 grand. And this is just, it's um, right now it's March. So in three months, my account's up already. I've already more than doubled it. Okay, so that's the power of day trading. Now you would say, Russ, well, geez, you know, you've you've turned less than six hundred dollars into ten million. Why didn't you start with ten million in your account? You'd be up, you know, to twenty million. Wrong. The reason, once again, is because in order to do that, my average share size right now is fifteen thousand shares. So if I was trading with a one million dollar account to have the same return, I would need to be trading with one hundred fifty thousand shares. If I was trading with a ten million dollar account, I would need to be trading with one point five million share average positions. Give me a break. You know that I can't do that. I mean, listen, some of the stocks that I trade haven't even sold 1.5 million shares onto the market. I would be buying the entire company with you know $10 million. So it's just not practical. You can't scale, but you can scale in these lower risk buckets. So this is what I do. I keep in my day trading bucket, I keep about $100,000. Now, sometimes I keep a little bit more in it when the account's bigger. Right now, it's close to $300,000. Um, but what I'll do soon is I'll take the profits out of that and I'll put it in my next bucket. Now, the next bucket uh, is bigger. It, it can hold a lot more in it. Now, this bucket, let's just say, for instance, um, well, for right now, we'll just, for the sake of argument, say we have really two buckets. We have day trading, and then we have, uh, for me, long-term investing. So I'm going to put it in this bucket here. And this bucket could hold billions. It literally could hold billions of dollars. Well, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, you could put billions of dollars here. Now, there's a lot of in-between, but some of the in-between requires more active management than I'm willing to put in. I put all my energy into day trading, as you might put all your energy into your regular nine to five job, which is fine. And then the profit that I make from day trading, the profit that you make from whatever you're doing, you put it aside to something passive that you don't have to think about, not even a little bit. It just grows on the side because you've got your thing that you have to focus on. And so that's what I do. This is my thing I focus on and I take all the profit and I put it over here. So this is now, for me, it's grown to millions and millions of dollars and it can just keep scaling. So right now, let's just say, for, well, for instance, for the sake of argument, let's just say I'm 20 years old, but we all know that that's not true. So I'm 39 years old right now. So we'll just use real numbers and stay real with this. So I'm 39 years old. Now that means I have a solid 20 years before uh, 59, which is when I can take out my Roth IRA tax-free. So right now, I have 20 years to benefit from compound interest. Now, what we know is that my account will double every uh, 10 years at 7% growth rate. So uh, so that means every 10 years. So by the age 49, this account, which is at 6 million, should be at 12 million. By 59, it should be at 24 million. And that's if I don't keep adding to it every single year but I'm going to keep adding to it every single year. Now, of course, my results are not typical. I'm producing a crazy amount of profit from trading, so I'm just keeping the, funneling it into this, but you can start this at your own level. I'm just doing, I mean, listen, I'm doing the same thing that maybe Warren Buffett or these other guys did, but they did it on a much bigger level, okay? So it's all scalable. It's all relative. You Don't compete against me. Just do what's right for you and start growing that account. Okay, so... Um, the, the whole idea is to move profits from high risk to low risk buckets. Now, there are some people out there that I that I know who don't take any money out of their day trading account. And I actually know a story of someone who incredibly during the dot-com bubble, this is insane, funded an account with a very small amount of money and turned it into over a hundred million bucks. I actually talked to hit the broker that was the, the overseeing uh, the firm when this trader was doing it. And he was like, we were like, all in, like watching this trade it was insane they were taking these crazy positions they were it was like they were letting it all ride letting it all ride letting it all ride and we kept saying like when you could take money out when you could take money out and he said and this is the really incredible thing they never took money out and then you know what happened the dot-com bubble burst and the account went all the way back to zero the only money he ever took out was to pay tax he never paid himself that was a huge mistake 
And, you know, you, you hear these stories and you learn lessons from them. So I hope you learn a lesson from that that I learned it myself. So most active traders will keep anywhere from $5,000 to $100,000 in their active trading accounts. Yeah, there's some big money traders that'll trade more. But the problem is, for me at least, I never want to empower myself to have enough money in my account to do something really stupid. Just because I know I can get emotionally hijacked. I can have a really bad day of trading. Or, you know, I can have bad luck. I, my you know, young child could walk over and press a couple buttons and my dog could come up and try to grab a bagel off my uh, desk here and press the buy button for 100,000 shares of something stupid. And next thing you know, I'm down, you know, big. So by consistently reinvesting profits and specifically focusing on dividend investing stocks, instead of just spending them, after five to 10 years of profitable trading and active reinvesting, it's actually possible to earn more on dividends than and from passive income than from active trading. Last year, was the first year in my career that I made more from my long-term account, which was passively invested, than I made from my short-term day trading account. That was a, a huge milestone for me. I don't know. I mean, it could happen again this year. I don't know. You know, it, it depends on how I do day trading. If I end up having like a three, four, five million dollar a year day trading, then no, I'm not going to be out, able to outperform that. But I was able to last year, and I'm really proud of that. This to me is the ultimate of financial independence. Most of us are trading because we want to be independent. We want to make money on our own terms. We don't want to be, um, you know, working a nine to five job. Now, the beginning of financial independence for some of you who are working nine to five jobs is to start doing uh, dividend investing and to start investing just in general, a beginner's guide to investing. You'll start making a little bit of money. And then usually if you get to a point where you're making enough money, you're going to take a more active role in your investing. So for some people, they start as passive investors and then turn into active investors. Now, for me, because I was young, I saw a lot more potential as an active trader, an active investor, just because of the job market during the Great Recession, which is when I got into the, the stock market. So I saw a lot more potential just going right into trading. And now I'm expanding into passive investing. So, so I'm doing a little bit backwards from most people, but that's okay. All right. So um, let's go ahead and jump into chapter number two. So now I want to walk you through my process of choosing the best dividend stocks to buy because there's a lot of dividend stocks out there, but I'm not going to like all of them. So let me walk you through the process that I've created. And I want to reiterate that this is another form of risk management. As an active day trader, risk management is very different because we're buying stocks that are super extended. So a stock might be up 40, 50, 60%, and I'm buying a dip for a move higher. I need to use a very tight stop. With the dividend investing strategy and with investing in general, risk management comes down to buying the right stock. If you choose the strongest stocks, that's your best uh, ticket for managing risk, ultimately. Like if, if you choose a strong stock, it's going to go higher. If you choose a bad stock, it's going to go lower. So stock selection is your best form of risk management for long-term investments and certainly for dividend investing. So my criteria, when I'm looking at a dividend stock, I'm going to look at four things. I'm going to look at the dividend yield. And I want to remind you that the highest yield is not always the better. The best, you can get really high yields on, well, you could get really high yields on some stocks that are very, very risky because there's, there's risk that the stock is not going to be around for a long time. So they're trying to attract investors with a high yield, but there's a reason for that. So don't fall into that trap. I'll actually show you the, um, not just my opinion, but the analytical data that the highest yielding stocks that are dividend stocks are not the, the best performing. So number one, I do look at the yield. Of course, I have to. Uh, I look at the dividend growth over the last three years, five years, and 10 years. I look at the consecutive years that the company's been paying a dividend. This is important. If they've been paying a dividend for only two years, it could still, you know, it's still subject to be canceled and, and not continue to pay it. If they've been paying a dividend for 20 years, for 30 years, okay, this 50 years, here we go. Now we've got something I can feel good about. And then I look at the dividend payout ratio. This is this is sort of helpful because it shows how much the company is burdened by the dividend they're paying out. Um, so it's the dividend um, versus the net income per share. Now, with day trading, I'm not really looking at, I honestly don't look at any of this stuff for day trading. But when I'm investing and I'm planning on holding something for a long time, I have to look at the financial condition of the company. I want to know that this company is going to be here in a long time. So one of the most important things I look at is free cash flow. Free cash flow, this comes back to uh, some of these big investors like Peter Lynch and uh, Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. 
these guys are huge advocates of buying shares of companies that are producing cash flow. The company has to produce cash flow. If it produces cash flow, that means it's producing a profit. So I want to see that it's got free cash flow, it's producing profit, and I want to see the free ca that free cash flow is growing. So the amount of profit they're producing is increasing, not decreasing. I look at the PE ratio. It's the price to earnings ratio. And I also compare it to other companies in the same sector, the same industry. And I compare it to the PE ratio of the market as a whole, the S&P 500. I look at the cash and the cash equivalents that the company has. I want to see and understand whether or not you know they're going to need to raise money anytime soon. I look at their total equity. I look at the return on the equity as a percentage. I look at their total debt that they're carrying. And I look at their debt to equity ratio. So these are the things that I look at when I'm analyzing and doing my due diligence on a stock and trying to decide whether or not it's a stock that I want to buy. Now, this graph breaks up dividend paying stocks into five groups. The first group is the group that pays the highest dividend, but they are not the group that performs the best. It's actually the second tier that performs the very best right here. Uh, some of the stocks that uh, do offer a dividend, but it's a lower dividend are also somewhat lower performing. So, you know, it, it is relative that it's better to have a stock that's paying a relatively higher dividend, but it doesn't have to be the highest. Highest is not the best, but uh, it should be relative to what other stocks are paying. Now, there's some interesting um, stats here about companies that grew or initiated a dividend that they've experienced the highest rates of return relative to other stocks, and that's been since 1973. So dividend growers, which means their dividend is growing, and dividend initiators, companies that have started paying a new dividend, they uh, are returning 10%. All right. Uh, dividend payers return uh, 9%. No change in dividend policy, unchanged. Okay. So they're doing just 7%. Dividend non-payers, companies that don't pay a dividend, on average from two, uh, 1973 to 2021, paying uh, or, or returning 4.79%. Dividend cutters and eliminators, well, they're not returning very well at all. And then the equal weighted S&P 500 index returning 8.2%. And it's worth noting that um, you get a dividend when you own the S&P 500 because many of the stocks in the S&P 500 do return a dividend. So the growers and initiators are important. So when we are looking at dividend aristocrats and dividend kings, we're looking at stocks, um, we're looking at companies that not only have a dividend, but they're continuing to grow the dividend. Even if it's not by a lot, it's still they're still growing it. So this uh, is a graph showing if you had invested your money in these different groups of stocks in 1973, where that money would be today. So if you invested just in dividend growers and initiators, you'd be at $14,000 from uh, your initial investment, which, um, gosh, now, let's see, now I can't remember. Um, I lost track of what the initial investment is, but it looks like it was it was very, very small. So very small initial investment in 1973 has grown the most with dividend growers and initiators, dividend payers, equal weight S&P 500. Again, this is what a lot of people are going to put their money in, the S&P 500. But the S&P 500 is not necessarily, as you could see, the best. It's not bad compared to some of the others, but it's not the best. So now I'm going to walk you through the criteria that I use for scanning to come up with an initial list of dividend paying stocks that I can then look at more carefully to decide which ones on that list I think could be suitable for a longer term investment. Okay, so number one, I look at the dividend yield and I have a minimum as 2%. This is a little bit high. There are some great dividend paying stocks uh, that are lower than that, but 2% is nice. Now, again, this is where it's a little bit tricky because if you've got a only a thousand dollar account, you know, 2% is 20 bucks a year. I mean, it's just not worth it. And to be honest, even with a four or five million dollar account, only um, 2% it is still very low except when you factor in that this is a defense a more defensive investment where you will also most likely benefit from underlying growth of the stock so you get the two percent annual payout in a dividend and then also you're getting the underlying growth payout ratio i like to see that it's under 80 percent, so the company is not burdened by the payout even that's a little high um the return on equity i just want to see that it's positive the stock has to have options, so I have to be able to trade options on it. That way I can maximize on my uh, profit potential from holding the position. 
The average volume, I'd like to see over a million shares a day. Now, you know, this is, you could, you could move this one around. You could make it a little lower if you wanted to. But if you have lower volume, then it's not going to be as liquid. It's not going to be as easy to get in and out. I like to say, I like to see earnings per share growth in the last five years at 5% and earnings per share growth in the next five years uh, estimated at 5%. I want to see that their gross margin is positive and I want to see that the price is above $50. So I use Finviz for this scan. Finviz is a free scanning software and is so, you know, it's free. There's a lot of ads on it. So it could be a little bit annoying there, uh, but it is free. And this is good for scanning. It's not real time market data, but that's okay for creating a list like this. So I've already plugged in all of these um, criteria, earnings per share, past five years, next five years, dividend yield, payout ratio under 80%, uh, return on equity positive, gross margin positive, optionable, over a million shares of volume and price over 50. And we just eliminated from the entire stock market of nearly 10,000 stocks. We've got 38 stocks on this list right now. So these are 38 possible stocks that I would be considering. We've got Costco, Lockheed Martin, um, APD, UNP, Union Pacific, ADP, D Dick Sporting Goods, Hershey. I mean, there's a lot of companies on here that you know, Procter & Gamble, GPC, Genuine Parts. Uh, there may be some companies on here that you're not familiar with, but we'll be able to look at those charts and then get into some more detail. Now, if I change the volume to over 500,000 shares, that gives us a couple more stocks. We come up to 43 total. So, you know, a few more come in. You wouldn't want to go much lower than that because then you'd be dealing with something that's really not liquid. If you change the dividend yield to 1%, that's going to double the number that are on here. But again, then you're only getting 1%. I mean, at that point, just for the sake of argument, you'd actually be better off in a way just with a treasury or a bond. 1% is just so low. 2% is already pretty low, but that's just what I have set as the minimum. And the rest of these are pretty much non-negotiable. A lower price, the, th the problem with lower price is that um, generally I find that these ones are not as good on the options side. And I want, a, I want a stock that I can trade options on because that's gonna allow me to significantly increase how much I can make. All right, so once I have this list here, then we go on to the next step of reviewing the results. So I can begin sorting and reviewing them. I start with a review of the chart and I, prefer, I look at the daily chart and I prefer to see stocks that are trending up and are above the 200 EMA, certainly. I'm not interested in buying a stock that's been selling off or going sideways. It's, it's possible that there could be a stock that's on this list that, um, you know, that is not positioned very well for whatever reason. The, the daily chart just isn't that great. Um, it's not impossible. So I'm going to avoid any of those stocks. I'm going to focus on stocks that have uh, a nice position relative to the 200 EMA. Now, I can program some of that into the scanner if I want to. I could do, let's see... Um, 200 day EMA, I could just say price above the 200 day um, SMA. And that brought it down to 25 stocks. So it did it did reduce it a little bit. So you could go ahead and add that. Um, there'd be nothing wrong with that. There might be a stock that's just below the 200 that could be interesting that you're cutting out. But but that would probably be okay to, to make that step. Um, currently, I'm avoiding oil stocks, um, energy stocks. I don't love the sector. I, I'm a little concerned about what the next 10 years is going to look like for these companies. So I'm just leaving those ones alone. Um, and although there are some great stocks that are priced higher, I'm also a little bit more cautious on them because the problem is for me, in order to trade options on these stocks, and I'll explain more about this um, as we get into the class a little bit further, but in order to trade options, I need to be able to buy at least 100 shares. So 100 shares of a $700 stock is $75,000. You know, now we're talking about a lot of money and I just might not, you know, feel comfortable putting that much money into one position. So that's something I have to be aware of. I naturally prefer stocks I'm familiar with where I can understand their business model and how they make money. I just feel more confident buying something I understand. I also avoid stocks with large amounts of debt or negative shareholder equity. Um, so... And I'll, I'll explain more about that in just a moment. So I take all of this, um, I take these results here, and then I put them into a um, an Excel sheet that I use. And this sheet 
uh, is something that I've been using for quite a while. And I, I love it because it just allows me, and I'll pull it up on the screen here. It allows me to look at these stocks and compare them. And I can sort this data in a number of different ways. Now, I don't want to make this feel overwhelming or complicated. So as you look at this sheet, there's a lot of numbers. This really does have a lot of data. And the reason that I can't share this with you is because I am subscribed to a market data vendor that allows me to API into here. So if I shared the doc with you, the calculations won't, won't work. Um, so in any case, this is a doc that I have that I like. And usually what I do is I'll put all the stocks into this list. So let's see. So these were the ones from Costco down that I just put in from today's import. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll start looking at the actual charts of these. I, For me, I'm a trader first. So it's easier for me to look at the chart and understand whether or not I want to look at the stock any further. So what I do, I pull up a stock chart like Costco. And I want to see the prices above the 200 moving average. Of course, we know it should be because of the scan. But I know that the 200 is considered a, a very logical level of support. So if the stock is way above it, as it is in this case, then I'd be buying it pretty high if I got in up here. So purely from a technical perspective, when I look at something like this, um, this is a pretty big sell-off that it just had. So it's not great. If I got in it here, I would probably want to set a stop at the low of this recent pullback. Because if it breaks that low to me, then it's just stair stepping down. But I honestly don't think that this is a great pattern because it's not clear that it's really holding any clear level of support from a technical perspective. From the fundamental perspective, when we just look at Costco, and that's just going to be this line here, what we see is that um, they've had three year three year dividend increasing is fine. Uh, I have to double check this number because this is actually the dividend per share uh, is showing higher on uh, two different data vendors. So I've just got to double check it. That's common. You've got to double check it. When it seems unusually low, you want to just double check it. So it's, I think it's actually quite a bit higher than this because we know it, it had to be above 2% minimum. Uh, so nonetheless, um, so I, I would just double check that. But the earnings over the last three years are growing. So that's great. The payout ratio is 27%, so that's great. They're not overwhelmed by paying out their dividend. They've got free cash flow. They've got free cash flow growth in the last three years, although it's smaller. The last five years and last 10 years are better. The PE ratio is 47. It's a little high um, compared to the S&P 500, but it, which is uh, currently, I think, about 19, 18, 18, 19, but it's not too bad. Um, total equity fine cash and cash equivalents is good you should, i mean this is a very rudimentary analysis but i also am able to compare it to other um other companies on this list and so i color where uh, stocks that stand out in a positive way um i'll see or in a negative way and everything else is like okay it's it's on par with with the other companies so it's all right um Let's see. So Costco was down here. Um, not a lot of debt. So uh, sh debt to shareholder ratio is very low. Uh, that's great. So from a technical perspective and from a fundamental perspective here, this is more of the nitty gritty. This looks okay. So I would say this is something that I could be interested in. Now it's just a question of, uh, do I like the price? Do I like it well enough as it sits right now? Oops, that was... Um... GE. Let me just confirm. Uh, yeah, but do I like it as it sits right now? N maybe not quite in, from the price perspective, from the chart, but I can keep it on my watch list. And then I just keep going down the list. So I'll look at the next one, Lockheed Martin. I look at Lockheed Martin and I see, oh gosh, it's right just at that 200. And it's got a history of being below it. So that chart to me doesn't look super strong. Also, it's worth noting this is a more expensive stock. It, you know, $400 right now. So uh, next one down, APD. Now, APD I already marked in red. I had scrolled over and I had noticed that um, they're not producing free cash flow. That's a problem. So I was like, nope, don't like that one. So from that perspective, even though, again, I could double check the data, um, but uh, it's indicating no. So I, I'd move on to the next one. Uh, regardless, the chart doesn't look that great anyways. So, so that one's off the list. Um, I keep going down and I just keep looking at each one of these from a chart perspective. 
it's hard for me to feel good about buying a stock when the chart looks terrible. And that's just the way it is for me because I've been a trader for so long. I would prefer to buy a dividend paying stock that is also trending nicely. I'm going to feel better about that. Um, so that was, um, so we had APD, we had UNP, that chart's fine. I would feel fine about this. Um, you've got a little bit of support in here, it seems to be holding this level. Dick Sporting Goods, again, understand the company. That's, but at this point right now, this is one of those scenarios where it would have been awesome if you were in it and then you had this gap up on earnings, but now it would feel like, uh, I got to wait for it to pull back a little bit. So it just made a big jump uh, on earnings. Um, Hershey, H-S-Y. So, well, maybe people aren't into chocolate right now. That's that's a tough chart. Uh, it's a big sell-off. However, uh, you do have support down here around 180. So if you get in a little bit lower, maybe, but it's below the 200 moving average. Not very bullish. That's, again, uh, based on doing a combination of looking at the fundamentals and the, the financial status of a company and also looking at the chart. DRI, not bad. Um, the Darden restaurants, not a bad chart. So you know this is um, this is tolerable. Obviously, the stock suffered big time in 2020 during the COVID pandemic lockdown, but is back up now. Target. Now we could look at Target. I'm curious about Target's um, free cash flow. So they're producing free cash flow, and what about their debt? Debt's a little high. Uh, compared to some of the other companies, it's like five times more than than Hershey, a lot more than Dick Sporting Goods. Uh, you know, so uh, it's a little high, but again, household name. But how did they compete? You know, with with Amazon and stuff like that. So, unfortunately, this stock, just looking at the chart, is actually a little too volatile. I would say, even for a dividend stock, it's up like sixty percent this year, which is great. But that's actually a little bit of a bigger swing than I would be prepared to be in. Uh, we go to Procter Gamble, next one down, and this is going to be one that's much more stable in price, right? So this is sort of my process of going through the list. And then what I'm able to do is generally come up with a short list and I highlight a few of my favorites. I say, all right, I like Qualcomm. I like BMY, Bristol-Myers Squid. I like LMT, Lockheed Martin. I like, you know, and again, maybe right now I don't like it today, but big picture, I could be okay with it. Coca-Cola, CVS, Pfizer, Procter Gamble. So I sort of make my my short list. And then once I have that watch list, I could begin sort of checking the stocks each day to see what the prices are. Now, when it comes to actually taking my position, first, we've got understanding what dividend stocks are. Then we've got the process of building a watch list. And now let's jump into chapter number three, which is going to be actually taking your first position. All right, so chapter three, buying a dividend stock. So the investing strategy, the process of actually buying, well, this is actually the easiest. All you have to do is press the buy button. You can do this on your mobile app. So I guess that doesn't have to be a very long chapter, but there are some different ways that you can create a position. So once I've made my short list of the stocks I like, I can begin looking for entries, knowing that trying to time the market has been proven to be ineffective. The better strategy is to just break the ice and take a position so I can begin selling options against that position. I could start by selling what are called cash secured puts until I fill my initial position. Now that may be like foreign language to you. You don't understand what that means. So I'm going to talk about what that means in just a second. But I also want to make sure that I enroll my account in DRIP. DRIP is dividend reinvestment plan. It means that when you get a dividend, that dividend is automatically reinvested into the company. So rather than receiving a check of, and just having cash in your account, you actually buy more shares with the dividend that comes in. And this is what people like Ronald Reed, Mr. Reed would have done, is they just keep reinvesting, reinvesting, reinvesting. So while the easiest way would just be to open your trading platform, type in Procter Gamble and click the ask to buy you know, 100 shares or whatever it is that you want to buy, um, there is another strategy, and this is going to get right into chapter four. So like I said, chapter three is very quick. Chapter four is called cash secured puts. This is an options trading strategy, and it does something pretty interesting. When you sell a cash secured put, you're selling someone an option contract. As the seller of the contract, you have an obligation. If you buy a put contract, you're buying the right to sell stock at a set price. 
a put contract can be used to protect to protect against the downside risk when you're holding a stock. So let's say, for instance, you buy a stock, you buy 100 shares of a stock at, um, you know, $200 a share. And then you also buy one contract, which is uh, equals 100 shares to sell the stock at $190 a share. If you did that, if the stock drops overnight to $50 a share, how much are you down? Well, your 100 shares, in with your 100 shares right here, it's true that you would be down uh, $150 a share, but you also bought right here the right to sell 100 shares at 190. So on that position, you're in the positive. So this is called a hedge and it actually reduces your risk. So you're actually only risking in this case, $10 a share. So options are very popular because they allow investors, big investors and small traders like myself or, or perhaps you as well to hedge positions. But they can also do something kind of cool. What you could do is you could sell someone, you could sell someone a put contract. And if you sell somebody a put contract, you are required to then buy the 100 shares that they want to sell. So if you already want to buy the stock in the first place, then I could pull up this chart and I could say, well, geez, I already said, oh, I want to get my chart. I already said that I want to buy, um, what was it? Um, we'll pull up um, Procter Gamble, just for instance, doesn't matter. We'll pull up Procter Gamble. Let's say, well, I already want to buy this if it comes down to the 200 moving average at 152. So I don't mind selling someone the right to sell me shares, right? Not only would I sell them that, and when you sell a put contract, you would get paid a little bit of money. Now you are on the hook to buy their 100 shares. It is an obligation. And so it's going to tie up that buying power as if you already own the position, but it allows you to make a little bit of money and then just wait for the stock to come down. Now, if the stock never comes down, then you don't have to buy the shares from that person because the, the stock never went that low which means you just get to keep the premium that you made from selling them that contract. And then you do it again. And you could do it a couple times until you eventually fill your position. Now, I, I sense that you might be feeling a little overwhelmed because what we're getting into right now is options trading strategy. And options trading strategy is a little different and more advanced than simply dividend investing. So perhaps maybe the best thing to do, the next chapter here, by the way, I was gonna go into, um, selling covered calls. And selling covered calls is a really popular way to generate income from your existing position. What you're doing with a covered call is you are selling someone the right to buy your shares, but you put it out at a higher price. So if you're in a stock at, let's say $200, you sell someone the right to um, buy your shares at 210. And you'll make a little bit of money when you sell them that contract. But if the stock comes up to 210, you have no choice but to sell your shares. So usually what traders will do is they'll continue to sell a contract to sell their shares just a little bit above where they think their shares are likely to be at the end of the contract term. That way they get to keep the money from selling the contract and they also get to keep their shares. That's the perfect world. So you get to make a little extra money selling this option, selling this contract, but you don't have to give up your shares. But if the stock does go up to that level, well, you got to sell your shares. So I think for this episode, maybe what we should do is we should end it here with the focus being on how to find the best stocks for the dividend investing strategy and to simply execute the strategy based on saying, I like this stock. I want to own it. I think it's going to be here in 10 years and 15 years. So I feel comfortable buying it here and adding to the position as it goes on. And I don't have to think about it any more than that. I'm not going to mess around with selling covered calls. I'm not going to mess around with trying to do cash secured puts and do options trading. That's over my head. I don't want to do that right now. For right now, I just want to be a dividend investor. And Ross, this class has been great. Thank you for saying that, by the way. I hope you hit the thumbs up. I hope you subscribe. And you know what? If you want to learn a little bit more about options trading, I'll have another class that you can watch dedicated to a beginner's guide to option trading. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Thanks as always for tuning in. I'll remind you as always that trading is risky. My results aren't typical. So manage your risk, take it slow. And we'll see you here for the next episode.